Hey everybody, Joe here from the Lions Led by Donkeys podcast. If you enjoy what we do here on the show and you think it's worth your hard-earned money, you can support the show via Patreon. Just a $1 donation gets you access to bonus episodes, our Discord, and regular episodes before everybody else. If you donate at an elevated level, you get even more bonus content. A digital copy of my book, The Hooligans of Kandahar, and a sticker from our Teespring store. Our show will always be ad-free and is totally supporter-driven. We use that money to pay our bills, buy research materials that make this show possible, and support charities like the Kurdish Red Crescent, the Flint Water Fund, and the Halo Trust. Consider joining the Legion of the Old Crow today, and now back to the show. Hello, and welcome back to the Lines of Buy Donkeys podcast. I'm Joe, and with me still, trapped in the Tannenberg content mines, is Nate. How you doing, Nate? I'm okay. Um, some some interesting sort of like lore in my actual day to day life. Um, I live in a house that's very old. Well, relatively speaking, it's 130 odd years old. And the landlady wanted to get a new mortgage, and in, now she's no longer trying to get a new mortgage because rates have gone up. But in the process of trying to get a new mortgage, she had a surveyor come through and check it out, who determined that uh, when someone remodeled this place, and I think it was probably the landlady's previous builder because she had this guy who worked for her who was an idiot who fucked everything up. Um, they decided to extend the ground floor for what they call the front room in you know, a British house by about two feet by cutting away part of the old, the actual like original construction wall and basically adding a false wall, like a hollow wall between it and uh, the, the other room. So they cut um, away a it- load-bearing wall. They cut away load-bearing wall and they didn't reinforce it. And so <laughs> they, they were like, we have to come and do some work on this. And then she also scheduled the surveyor to come back just to make sure the work was done correctly when the builder was starting the project, the new guy who's actually good at his job. And yesterday they were like, ah, this is way worse than we thought it was going to be. We're going to need you guys to be out for like another week. So we've been out of the house since Monday. We will be out of the house uh, until Wednesday night. Uh, so basically, yeah, like like nine days, 10 days. I can't fucking think. And uh, fine, we got a hotel. But like the landlady was like, it's fine. You get a hotel. I'll, I'll pay for it. Great. So we did that. The problem is we got a good price on a hotel for a three three night stay in London. London's a very expensive city. I can city. attest to that. Yeah, I just had to pay hotel fees there. We have to extend uh, the, the, our reservation, which is no longer the discounted price. So I am 100% sure she's not going to end up paying this bill because it's a lot of money. And so it's just like, fuck. Uh, I mean, it's a nice hotel. It's nice to, it's nice to be in a hotel room that's warm because our house isn't ever. Um, it wasn't that bad. It's just one of those it, was, it wasn't cold. It gets very cold at Uh, night, especially upstairs. I I will say my apartment is probably colder, but that's only because I'm a cheap fuck and I rarely turn on the gas. (laughs) Even though gas here is obscenely cheap. We have the gas going uh, with the boiler going like, you know, keep the house at a constant temperature. But the problem is the system is so inefficient. It just doesn't work very well. Um, And uh, yeah, one of those situations where you're just like, ah, I I, I greatly appreciate the fact that, um, you know, we're... (laughs) You pay a lot to live in a city like this, but these are all houses that used to cost basically very, very little and now cost a lot because the British property market is so insane. And uh, so it's just like th- they have the maintenance of like flop houses, but they cost like the equivalent of a million dollars if you wanted to buy one. That is that is one thing I can say here is like, I'm not going to say I live in a nice apartment, but I will say like it is in fact an apartment. Uh, and say what you will about uh, like Soviet reconstruction or soviet construction but it keeps the heat in very well because it's all concrete Uh, (laughs) so i don't have to worry about however in the summer it is a motherfucker because it is hot as fuck um yeah i can only imagine you know the caucasus getting warm and so on and so forth i will say like I'm, i'm also like this is my second winter in the caucasus and i always assumed that it was going to be just absolutely brutal um michigan winters significantly worse uh, so like, it, it, I was actually quite shocked by that. Um, like it, we don't even have snow other parts. I mean, some parts of the country will have snow, but Yerevan doesn't, uh, like it snowed twice, I think. And it stuck for one whole day. Like a Midwestern winter is so much worse than, uh, than an Armenian winter, which is kind of wild to think about. Um, that is funny. I mean, yeah, it's the same thing. Like people talk about it, like people who come from, from the UK visit the U S and they, they freak out about the weather and it's just like, right. But, England just has mild weather, so of course, like, <laughs> I don't think our weather is, in America is that much more extreme than like what they experience in a lot of Central Europe, for example. Like, maybe a little colder, maybe a little hotter at times, but like, definitely more humid in America. But like, people come to New York and they're like, "God, I can't believe it's so fucking cold." How does anyone survive? And it's like because this is actually kind of normal for the Northern Hemisphere. England is just 
an island surrounded by water with the jet stream bringing warm water and warm air. So, you know, the entire country basically shuts down if it ever gets below freezing here. Whereas, you know, in New York, you'll have weeks at a time when it doesn't get above freezing. Like, that's normal. Yeah. Like, below 15 Fahrenheit, below 10 Fahrenheit, that fucking sucks. That's kind of out of the ordinary. But, like, you know, mid to high 20s is your high that for, like, nonstop for a couple of weeks in January, February. That's normal in New York. Yeah. And in Indiana, fuck, dude. I remember walking to class my freshman year at IU where the low was negative 15 Fahrenheit and the high was negative <laughs> 5. Like, <laughs> which I can't do the calculation in, into Celsius in my head for that, but it's, it's extremely cold. I think it might be in like the negative 20 to negative 25 range in Celsius. It's bad. It sucks. Really that fucking bad. fucking sucks. Yeah. The coldest I ever saw in my life was Anchorage, Alaska in January one time. It was negative 37 Fahrenheit. So that's about the same in, fel- in Celsius. It's basically about like negative 38 yeah, Celsius. I it. So yeah, fuck that. I think that. the coldest I've ever been was in Northeastern Afghanistan during the winter. But that was like, I mean, their winters suck. Uh, Michigan winter is still colder, has more ice, has more snow. But you also have like, I'm going to go into this building with insulation and heat uh, in, in the Midwest and Afghanistan, you know, you're living in a tent. So everything is just miserable all the time. That was definitely the coldest I've ever been. Um, but I think the coldest temperature that I've ever experienced is almost certainly the year. You might remember this with the year where the, almost the entire Midwest lost power because the Niagara Falls uh, transfer station for electricity exploded. Maybe. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Because I, 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 I moved to Indiana in 1996. So if it was before then, I wouldn't have experienced it. But the coldest winter I can remember in Indiana was we had a blizzard right before school was supposed to come back. So we wound up having an extra week of winter break um, just because we had a snowstorm and then a freezing rainstorm and then another snowstorm on top of it. (laughs) And it was just like, so you just had this perfect cake of snow, ice and snow that lasted, I mean, for fucking months, man. Like it was, it was probably March before it really broke up. And yeah, it was, it was one of those times where it's like, oh sweet, we don't go to school, but like you couldn't really do anything. So it kind of sucked actually. You just knew that like you were going to have, uh, time extended onto the school year to make up for it. Yeah, yeah, and that's why I always hated fucking snow days because, like, what, a there's really nothing to do because uh, it's so brutal outside. You really can't do anything for very long. And then come like June or whatever, I have to stay at school for an extra two or three days or however many snow days we had. Uh, it's fucking miserable. Speaking of miserable, Nate, I was gonna say, <laughs> great segue, Joe. Great segue. Uh, we're still talking about the Battle of Tannenberg. We're on part two of three. And when we left you last time, uh, last time on the Battle of Tannenberg, I'm going to have to have Tom edit in like the Dragon Ball Z fucking sound. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> last time on Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> when we left you last time, the Russian Imperial Army had invaded Eastern Prussia after the outbreak of the Great War. The understrength and badly commanded German defenders found themselves flailing and on the verge of mutiny against their commander, 8th Army General Pritzwitz. Uh, who eventually found himself fired and replaced by Paul von Hindenburg, along with Eric Ludendorff, who joined the staff as his second, the, the, the Eighth Army Chief of Staff. I didn't really talk about it during the script, but it's also quite funny that Pritzwitz didn't actually find out he was fired until Paul von Hindenburg showed up. Um, nobody told him. Uh, <laughs> so he just shows up at his headquarters like, all right, fuck nuts, Yeah, out. pretty much. Uh, I, what, what probably happened is the message got passed, but nobody was talking to him anymore yeah I mean, it just it does make it funnier and then like almost immediately after he dies of a heart attack oh well i mean he was really old wasn't he like he was just f- fully like teetering on the brink yeah. of death, killing yeah he's dying old anyway. and very like he's incredibly overweight and unhealthy uh and he didn't i mean he lived his life in the, the prussian and then german imperial military he was not a healthy man uh, I think he died, I died a say, few so months to a year. Once again, later. Midwest representation. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You basically live in what's effectively Germany, the Midwest, uh, in terms of the makeup of the white people who live there, and then you live really unhealthily and you die. Yeah, you just live like someone who's from Milwaukee for 80 years and then die. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And if you if you make it to Sturgis, you probably wore one of the fucking pointy helmets. Oh God, that's probably at true. One point in yeah. your life, uh, the, which which we talked about last time, and uh, I completely forgot the fucking German name. Oh, for the, the helmet. It's okay. Ah, Picklehaube. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Very dumb butt plug topped helmet that everybody hated. Exactly. Um, now, before we move on, we should probably talk about the two main men of the upcoming battle because we're going to be talking about Ludendorff and uh, Hindenburg quite a lot, um, unfortunately. Now, Eric Lundorf was, even for the Imperial German military 
and previous to that, the Prussian military, a fucking asshole. Uh, everybody knew him as one. He had no friends and everybody seemed to hate him. According to most people who knew him, he didn't like anybody to include his own family, uh, which means he might just be the German version of my dad. Um, <laughs> that, that's the one. I get one per episode. The, the, everything written about him was like he was a fucking dick. Nobody likes him. Uh, and on top of that, he wasn't even considered that good of a military commander until World War I. He rose to the attention of von Moltke the Younger uh, because he thought of him for, for this job after his action at the Belgian fortress of Liege during the opening stages of the war. If it, it's, a, it's a battle that we probably will cover at some point, uh, but this fortress, because the Belgians at the time really loved them some fortresses, have been holding back German attackers for a few days, and they've been inflicting pretty bad casualties on them, mostly due to inept German command on the ground. Uh, make a long story short, they seemed shy about bringing their artillery forward and just shelling the piss out of the fortresses. Uh, and they mm -hmm. really seemed to just be sending in their men unsupported. Because uh, remember, most gun crews at this stage are unfamiliar with the concept of indirect fire. So direct fire artillery only. Uh, and so Ludendorff ignored orders, got in his car, drove to the front line and took command of the battle personally. Uh, and turn the turn the tide of the battle. Now, most of the most of the way he turned the tide was like move the fucking cannons up, and then they just eliminated the fortress. There is also a very famous story of him literally knocking on the door of a fortress and telling them to surrender, and they did. Uh, not all of them did, of course. Some of the Belgians did fight pretty much to the end until their fortress was reduced down to rubble and dead Belgians. Uh, but and, and you know, it it did tell a lot of people during the war, like, oh, maybe fortresses are not a good idea. Uh, famously a piece of information the French would then ignore. <laughs> I was going to say, exactly. I was going to say, yeah, you know, I, I, I feel as though there was all this fortress construction uh, that they would later put to such great use in the beginning of uh, World War II. Yeah. But, um, I, I do really want to do an a episode or a series on the fall of France because it seems like nobody really talks about it. Everybody likes to assume that like, Germans drove around the Maginot line and the French immediately surrendered rather than like the French military just getting fucking mangled trying to defend themselves. Uh, it, it really does seem to be a part of World War II that people just gloss over. Something that I find very, very interesting is, um, is that, you know, obviously part of the sort of French fascist legend uh, and the kind of cult of personality surrounding um, Marshal Patin uh, is yeah. that the, the, the basically like oh well the the the, the sort of quasi socialist French government the social democratic government of France in the 1930s just was too obsessed with gender and smoking cigarettes <laughs> like Lee they were basically like the yeah they, they were basically like oh <laughs> on a perdu la guerre à part du, uh, à cause de le wokisme <laughs> yeah and it's just it's genuinely that shit um but it's also very funny because like a lot of those people went you know to their to their dying day uh believed this shit and um there's one guy i would love for us to talk about uh louis ferdinand celine who wrote a great novel about world war one and was like mr anti-semitism and ended the war hiding in a chateau with like part of the vichy government like in strasbourg like basically holed up in a castle it's a very very strange story and i realize that's a digression but i'm just saying that like all of these kinds of things about yeah fortresses the maginot line and like the weird kind of kind of cult of historical understanding that comes about all of these things is very very funny and i do think that like you'll find some similar ones from world war one oh absolutely um, yeah Big, 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 big fortresses kind of on the way out by, you know, 1914, definitely on the way out by 1940. Yeah. And it's, it's another character we're eventually going to have to talk about whenever we like breach Verdun is like Joseph Joffre and Philip Patton, because it's like, man, you would have died a fucking hero if you stroked out about 10 years before you died. Yep. Yeah, but exactly. <laughs> but, but, but they made him Monsieur le Président anti wokisme Yeah. Le fascisme. That shit happened. Uh <laughs> ah oui, c'est vrai, le fascisme, c'est cool. I don't think he talked like I that. Assume, he probably had this very I, highfalutin style of speaking. I'm sure there's recordings I'm, of him. I'm, like assuming, that he, microphones I'm assuming he spoke exactly like that while holding three cigarettes and balancing on a unicycle. Exactly. He's like, oh, il y a longtemps, il n'y avait pas de problème avec mes maîtresses. Maintenant, le wokiste, ils disent que ce n'est pas une bonne idée. Hein. While simultaneously buried nut deep into his mistress. Well, yeah, I don't know. You don't speak French, but that's exactly what I was talking about. 
what I said was a long time ago. It was fine for me to have, have mistresses, but the the wokest say I'm not allowed to. It's a bad idea. Uh, spiritually, <laughs> I speak French because of my grandfather. Um, now, the... Uh, <laughs> it's extremely funny. Okay, when it came to Ludendorff taking over as chief of staff, he was... Uh, pretty much picked specifically for that prickishness that everybody knew him for. Uh, because Pritzwitz was such a weak leader in every way, people simply ignored him and pushed him around. And they figured, look, we don't really like Lundorf that much, but nobody's going to push him around. He simply won't let it happen. He's too much of a dick. Um, so they figured he, w- and not to mention, he had a, a pretty good reputation that, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on, the German imperial military, despite everybody like thinking that it's like this effectively army of automaton brained Prussians, did have uh, a culture of like taking the initiative if something wasn't working. And he had a really good reputation of doing that like at Liege. So they're like, well, if everything falls apart, Lundorf will just handle things. Yep. Um, and then we come to Paul von Hindenburg, a guy picked, and this is true, by default. Uh, which is also the way I was promoted. So I guess I'm on his side here. Uh, now, the reason why he, well, one of the reasons why he was picked is that he lived in Hanover, which was apparently a really easy train ride to get to East Prussia. That was it. Like he can get here fast. Um, and like that was one of the main reasons uh, that he could jump on a train and be here in a couple of days. The other reason was he was old as shit. He was born in 1847. He had fought in the world's wars of German unification, starting at the ripe age of 11 as a cadet, uh, which meant that he had one hell of a seniority over virtually anyone else up for the role. Um, he had also previously committed von Francois, the guy who repeatedly acted without orders, uh, and the general staff figured he would be able to control von Francois. Uh, now, they would be wrong about that because that man cannot be controlled, but it was a good idea. Now, there is something of a, of a pervasive rumor that by the start of World War I, when, where Hindenburg came out of retirement, because he had been retired for quite some time, um, mm-hmm. and he just demanded an active frontline command, that he was starting to go senile. Uh, this is something that, this is a belief that kind of survives to the modern day, because when he was president of the Weimar Republic, he was senile. Um, he was senile and a fascist, which is not a good combination. Um, now other people assume that he wasn't senile during world war one. He was simply stupid. Uh, I'm not sure which one to believe. Like they called him quote, simple minded. Um, so dumb or declining with age. Um, and this is obviously pushed by like, there's a pro Ludendorff faction of the, in the legacy of the battle of Tannenberg that obviously Ludendorff himself spreads a lot of these rumors. Uh, because the two had gone to fucking hate one another until they both died. Uh, however, there might be some truth to it more than just Ludendorff uh, saying that Hindenburg was slipping with age. There was the fact he had been shot in the fucking head during the Austro-Prussian War, and that'll that'll slow you down a bit mentally. Just a yeah. little. I mean, I, I genuinely am not as quick on my uh, sort of verbal responses to things since I got in a bike wreck in 2019 and got a really bad concussion, and that was just me hitting the ground on the back of my head wearing a helmet, there was no bullet involved. Yeah. So like, I can only imagine like if, if, uh, if, if I had gotten drive by in London off my bike and gotten shot, you know, then that would have been really bad. I probably wouldn't be able to podcast anymore. I certainly wouldn't be able to command an army. Yeah. A whole fucking uh, army. Yeah. Now, like I've had quite a few pretty serious concussions, um, in my life and I think I've mostly recovered from them. Uh, but I yeah. also have not caught a, like a Manet ball in the fucking gray matter. Uh, cause this is a, this wasn't like a glance off of his skull by any stretch of the imagination. He was full on. I mean, I think it wasn't a Manet ball at the time, but whatever. He got shot in the head. Um, and the Kaiser hated both of them, but hated Hindenburg more. Now this is mostly because Hindenburg also hated the fucking Kaiser, despite the fact he was a monarchist. He just hated Wilhelm as a person, not the office. Um, because the Kaiser was an overbearing idiot when it came to military affairs, which is true. He absolutely was. Kaiser Wilhelm saw himself as the actual commander-in-chief of the German Imperial Army, despite having no military education, training, any experience of his own. He could never serve in the military because he had a deformed hand. So basically, not too far removed from being German Napoleon III or Prussian Napoleon III. Yeah, that's pretty accurate, actually. Yeah. Um, 
Like, and this is not a Hindenburg's feelings towards the Kaiser were not uncommon within the German uh, military officer corps. Almost all of them hated their monarch because he thought that he was the German Napoleon and micromanaged military commanders when, to be fair, he was one of those things being a micromanaging dickhead. Um, and this is also quite ironic when you realize that the German empire would effectively be a military dictatorship under Hindenburg by the end of the war. Um, and the Kaiser would be completely sidelined because he was a fucking idiot. He wasn't good at the non-military stuff either, but for a long time, he had people to pick up after him. But after the war started, there's really nothing you could do, you know? Not that Americans know anything about being ruled by senile people. No, not at all. They're fucking idiots. I can't say many nice things about the current government of Armenia, but I will say it's not that old. <laughs> Yeah, it is very, very strange in America how we've gotten to this point where basically it's like the qualifications for office is, are you 70 and do you use adult diapers? <laughs> but I mean, that's just that's just the nature of things. The, you know, the, the, the big stretch of, I would say the baby boomers, but a lot of them are like too old to be baby boomers. And they're fucking silent generation. <laughs> like, it's incredible. Uh, our prime minister doesn't use adult diapers because of age. He simply looks like he uses an adult diaper and it's full at all times. <laughs> Roger, yeah, well... You know, that's just the nature of things being ruled by idiots. We're 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 ruled by a guy who uh, asked a homeless person if they wanted to uh to study business. Oh my god, in a I remember shelter. that. <laughs> oh, it's fucking incredible. Yes. Uh, it's like I just want to get so, through the day. Like, but have you thought about investing in business? Yes. No, man, I'm homeless. <laughs> he di- genuinely it's strange that we R- Rishi Sunak's parents paid so much for him to go to Winchester and he now talks like fucking um what's his name? The <laughs> <laughs> the character from Bojack Horseman. Once again, my memory is failing me. Uh, Vincent Adult Man. <laughs> it's just the fucking three kids in a trench coat sitting on each other's shoulders. Oh, man. Now, uh, Hindenburg was so old uh, that when he showed up to the Eastern Prussian 8th Army Command, he was still wearing his old Prussian blue army uniform because he had not been issued a new German field gray. Now, to be honest with you, if I got drafted back in the army, I'd show up in my ACUs and be like, what up? <laughs> Guess what? You guys want to bring me back and deal with my old guy shit? I'm going to be talking about Blue Force Tracker all day, even though I'm sure you have something newer and worse. Yeah. I was in long enough to get the, 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 to be able to wear multicam, but they, the multicam that they're wearing now is different. Mine would still be old. Yeah, I, 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 would, have been, I would have gotten multicam if I deployed um, before I got out. I got it, I, my, the deployment that I did, I got back in 2010, and they were just starting to bring them out for units going to deployment but for garrison uniforms i just missed it and it's like whatever yeah. who cares yeah the, uh, the my second deployment to afghanistan when we all got multicam they didn't know we were gonna get it so they had us all go through rfi to get acu and they're like oh just kidding we're gonna get uh uh multicam stuff no don't turn in the acu stuff also go to rfi and pull even more gear in multicam so i had like six fucking sets of rfi gear that i had to turn in when i got out i was like wow thank you fort hood you fucking idiots um, I love RFIing stuff. Ra- it's it's rapid fielding initiative for those of you it's basically for like those without when brain you damage. Would deploy- <laughs> yeah, they would do- for those of you who don't suffer from TBI and the consequences thereof. Uh, when you would deploy, like rather because they would want to give you newer kit to take with you to a deployment, and, and not it wouldn't they wouldn't want to wait to field it to the entire army. They would basically just be like, okay, you know every company got its fucking date to go through this big hangar where they just like cycle through a bunch of stations and they give you like the new body armor, the new equipment carrier, like any stuff specifically for downrange, like the, uh, the improved first aid kit, um, you know, a tourniquet, fucking a seatbelt cutter, a, a good, like, multi-tool stuff like that uh in our case like new helmets new helmet pads uh when they a determined car, a that the created pr- pocket pussy <laughs> when they determined that the fucking the the, the, the the united prison industries had made a bad lot of fucking helmets they had to give us new ones because yes oh uh, yeah i do remember that i do remember that our ballistic armor yeah like it's buddy now uh by the time they both arrived uh that being ludendorff and hindenburg the eastern front was rapidly falling to pieces the 8th Army was still in chaos, and across the border, the Austro-Hungarians had launched an offensive in Iglesia, something the Germans warned them not to do because they'd be completely unable to support them. And surprise, surprise, because it's the Austro-Hungarian military, the entire operation was falling apart and failing. Konrad von Hotzendorf begged the Germans to launch an attack to pull his ass out of the fire, something he would do countless times throughout World War I. Now, the Germans couldn't do this due to the advance of the Russian 2nd and 1st Armies. 
uh, because you know they only had one army against the two. There's no way they can conduct offensive operations into Russia. Uh, now, the Germans didn't know this, but the Russian first and second armies were already pretty much coming apart at the seams. The second army was advancing on a 60-kilometer front, but was so badly organized that it was strung along and scattered. Now, this is mostly due to inexperience rather than any kind of active incompetence. Their officer corps just didn't know how to keep an army together because they've never had to do it before. They didn't have training. Not only was the second army made up of units from three different military districts, meaning they didn't know each other or had never worked together before, but a full 60% of the entire army, officers included, had been in uniform for no more than five weeks having just been called up and the officers having no actual officer training. Uh, so whoops. Great. That sounds excellent. Yeah. You know, all I can say that sounds like a recipe for success. I think uh, good things are going to happen. I expect the rest of this episode will just be positive things. Please. <laughs> that, that is the, the thing that our show is known for is talking about positive things that don't go wrong. Exactly. Exactly. Now, anybody who's ever been to, you know, Europe, uh, any part of Europe during say August, uh, knows that the temperatures get quite hot. Uh, and at yes. this point, it's about 90 degrees or a little bit higher. Uh, and a bad supply system but in the Russian military meant that by the time their invasion of Prussia started, they were already out of water. Uh, and not to remember, they're also their uniforms are all wool. Uh, so it's not, it's not comfortable. There's legendary amounts of swamp ass happening. Uh, and people are already starting to be heat casualties. We've already talked about some <laughs> last That's episode, right. and all I can say is that, yeah, August in Europe, it's, look, it doesn't typically get as hot as most of America does, but, like, if you live in, say, for example, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, like, it's not too dissimilar. Like, it gets, in some places, it'll absolutely get into, like, let's say, the mid-90s. It's just not quite as humid, but it sucks, and if you're wearing wool and you're trooping around carrying shit on your back, God knows if you're, like, doing infantry combat you will get insanely hot. Like, it's it's very, very, very warm. Like, uh, this past year was kind of an anomaly, but, like, it's not on... Back in those days, it was common for it to get, you know, into, like, the mid-80s to the to the low to mid-90s in, in August in Europe. That's still pretty common. So, although Europe is in general, Western Europe is in general milder, then uh, certainly it's milder than what you'd expect at that latitude, say, in North America, because, like, London is further north than Vancouver, Canada. Um, like it's it's milder, uh, it still gets hotter than dog shit in the summertime. Now here in the South Caucasus in the summer, it can break easily break ninety by August. I think we broke a hundred uh, this last summer, but only for, only for yeah, like a day broke, or two. It got we had a hundred and four in Jesus London last year. Christ. It really sucked. Yeah, it was I insane. pretty much just laid on the my floor and tried not to die. <laughs> it got so hot, it just made more sense to close all the windows and blinds yeah. because it's like if you let air in from the outside. It just gets balls hot inside too. Like it's it was actually genuinely it's, unreal. It's like trying to cool yourself off with a hair dryer. Yeah, and you know the Brits, they don't complain about the weather at all. <laughs> Famously, they don't do that. So yeah. Uh, there was also the fun fact that hundreds of thousands of men were marching through a dry countryside in the middle of August. So I mean, if you've ever seen a large body of men, and you know if you're listening and you've never had to see this, I don't. Oh, I've seen a large body of men. <laughs> I've seen the largest bodies of men. Uh, but, you know, soldiers marching through places is a lot like a, you know, a herd of livestock, right? They destroy everything and they were churning the countryside into dust. And so within a few days of campaigning, the Russian military had been struggling through what was effectively a man-made dust bowl. Well, the dust bowl is also man-made. This is an army-made dust bowl. Fair enough. Different kind of dust bowl, creating the big yeah. dust bowl, but still a dust bowl nonetheless. Soon, hungry and thirsty soldiers began straggling behind, deserting, or simply getting lost in blinding dust storms. General Samsonov, commander of the Second Army, pointed out that everybody who was falling behind must have been the Jews, because good Russians wouldn't do such a thing. It's still the Russian Empire, folks. There's got to be the anti-Semitism in there somewhere. My co-host and friend Alice Caldwell Kelly once described the the Russian Civil War as a conflict between generals on on the Bolshevik side who would say things like chess, comma, <laughs> is the tennis of the mind or something to that effect, and that uh, that the, the white generals were basically like effectively Prussians who kept a ham under their coat to ward off the Jew. <laughs> 
And I know she's not wrong. I'm probably misquoting, but it's very, very, very funny and true. It's mostly accurate, um, yeah. I will say, too, there's always a part of me that I think about deserting back in those days where it's like, you know, you had to carry your like ID card in your breast pocket because like there was no formal like, you know, personnel registry system. You just everywhere you went, you had to show your ID card or you basically got arrested for suspicion of desertion. And it's like there's also part. But then there's also part of me that's like you could just fuck off out of a column and be like, I'm done. Yeah. I'm going to be a hermit. I'm living in the woods. I'm going to shit. I'm someone else now. This is absolutely the era of time where you could just disappear as a person. Like I, I'm private Vasily, whatever, and I'm like, man, I don't have boots. I haven't had a drink of water in two days. I'm somewhere in Germany. Fuck this. I'm walking away. Exactly. I'm getting on a boat and I'm going to America. And then 50 years from now, I'm doing an animated story of my family history, except it's mice, and it's going to be called an American Tale. <laughs> Fuck all of you. I'm done. And if you like, were worried about your officers catching you, if you look to the left, the officer would probably be deserting with you. So it really doesn't matter. So, Private, I have heard there are no cats in America. Can you tell me if this is true or not? You are not Jewish, are you? Oh, I'm very concerned about this surname, Mouskowitz. <laughs> it sounds quite Jewish, actually. Sir, is that a, a necklace of ham that you're wearing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, honestly, the problem that is my Russian accent now starts shifting towards sounding Israeli, so I should probably just <laughs> not mean, do it. That's kind of the same accent. It's basically the same. It's basically the same. Now, the army could also hardly communicate as the Russians ran out of telegraph wire or simply forgot to bring it. Um, now, this began, uh, became a bit of a problem when enemy scouts and also just angry German civilians began cutting uh, the telegraph wire. You know, partisans, whatever. Uh, cavalry did this a lot where they would go behind enemy lines and cut telegraph wire. Um, and when the Russians sent in the repairmen, the guys tabbed to be in charge of fixing telegraph wire, like, sir, we don't know how to fix telegraph wire. <laughs> I've never done this before. Also, what the fuck is a telegraph? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I re- okay, I realize that there's a long stretch of time that these were it was well known at this point, but because it's so close to the 19th century, there's a part of me that wants to imagine like they send out like a telegraph signalman and he's just like, "Wait, you can talk over a wire? What the fuck is this I'm shit?" I'm a horse doctor. Like, I was going to say I can imagine I can imagine Kaiser Wilhelm is more like, "Wait, you can talk through a wire?" What? You mean I don't have to carve my letters into a peasant's back? So you mean you mean all of these pigeons are for nothing? <laughs> and I mean, not to mention, you know, when when the Russian Empire starts drafting people, they draft people from the middle of fucking nowhere first. And it's always been that way. The Soviet Union was the exact same way. So, like, it's always the minorities that get scooped up first who, by design, have the worst amount of infrastructure going out to the republics and oblasts and whatever. Back then, they were called, you know, something else. But, you know, so you have guys who absolutely have never seen a telegraph before being told the word a uh, lot like lay down telegraph wire after being drafted three weeks ago so it's like but it's cool like once you have them you can like if you if your signal wire gets cut you can just use these guys as like tuvan throat singing wind talkers <laughs> they can just communicate in a different way you know what it's it's it's, it's redundancy on your yeah, comms there you go uh, now the length of their of the russian advancement dispatch riders took too long and nobody in the russian military at the time had car had access to cars or motorcycles um, I mean, this is very early in World War One. There was not a lot of cars floating around at all. Um, this is the future urbanist war. <laughs> <laughs> and like the German general staff had some shitty old cars. Because remember, even having a car back then kind of sucked. Like, th- there were well, no yeah, roads. Had, like, wooden yeah, wheels. yeah, like yeah, you'd yeah, be driving exactly. over horse tracks. Like oh, car snapped in half. Yeah, it's, just, it's a combination of like no road has ever been paved because why would it be? And what the fuck is a car? <laughs> yeah. Like it's not really a good moment in time to be you know whipping ass around. As an in. airplane flies overhead, only like ten years for after it was invented. <laughs> exactly. Once again, what the fuck is an airplane? Humans can do that. Is someone from like being drafted into like the Ottoman army or whatever, being like scraped and from the highlands, like what the fuck is in the sky? Oh God, that horse is metal. Someone send me back home exactly. to my village. <laughs> And also, this is the era when, like, absinthe would make you trip. So, like, everyone is going to be doubting their senses. <laughs> so, General Samsonov, commander of the Second Army, used the easiest thing he had for communication, which was radios. Now, I know that sounds normal, especially for this show. Uh, but these are radios from 1914, but were much, much more likely manufactured years before then. They were hit and miss at best. And when they worked, they were completely unencrypted because nobody encrypted anything yet. They were broadcasted in the open in plain Russian. 
And that meant any German listening nearby could simply tap in and like, oh, yeah, I can hear the Russian radio communications. I presume, though, like the tapping in is going to be done by like, say, signalmen from the German yes. side. Yeah, I mean, you can... Because I was just like, I, I just was again, like, I know radios are primitive, but I imagine in this part of the world, like, you're, you know, it's so early on in that technology that, like, they're not going to be like a common thing that people have. No, no, it, it's the German military specifically. And it, it, it is literally as easy as turning a dial around and like listening in because they all use the same yeah. exact kinds of radios generally. And because I guess in my mind, I thought 1914 radios would be like 1940 computers. And so their radio is like the fucking big wheel from Fritz Lang's Metropolis. It's <laughs> like fucking turn it back like a guy all day having to fucking just turn it to different positions to make it work. Uh, it, the size of, of a fucking a company barracks. It, it's I mean, they're they're not great. And the Germans radios were better. Um, but I'm not going to say that the German radio operation was better, though. Fewer Russians spoke German than Germans spoke Russian. So the Germans had a much easier time listening in. And, you know, over time, code, like primitive codes were developed. Like, I mean, because codes had already existed in written di- uh, dispatches and stuff like that, mm-hmm. but hadn't quite made the jump to radios. Because, again, this is weeks after World War I has started. There's a lot of innovation that's going to happen in the next couple of years that has not happened yet. Uh, now, yeah. the dumbest part is, and we can you know, say this about most things about the, the Russian military, is the Russians fucking knew this. They had just experienced this in their war against Japan. Um, The Japanese had a lot of Russian speakers in the military because they knew how to like tap into radio communications. And the Russians were, again, broadcasting their orders, orders of battle, movements, et cetera, et cetera, in plain Russian over an unencrypted radio network. And the Japanese were just like, oh, this is what they're going to do. Uh, <laughs> it's like oh, definitely do not conduct forward operations today everybody has swamp ass to impossible degree it would be terrible if Japanese person heard me say this and what's even dumber is that the Russians could pick up German radio communications as well so like they knew everything they said over the radio was being listened to <laughs> wow it sure would be terrible if other people could do this anyway I'm not going to think about it yeah no, no need to look too far to this one uh, meanwhile, the first army, the Russian first army, had still yet to move after fighting off the German attack previously. They still had no supplies, and the men were beginning to desert because that is literally always happening in the Russian military. People are always deserting. Um, I mean, this is kind of a common problem across most armies during World War One. It was desertion, malingering, stuff like that. But that would happen for you know, armies like Germany and France in a couple of years. Uh, the Russia simply started off with their military already falling apart. For instance, several of General Renenkampf's subordinates suggest that they should probably retreat out of eastern Prussia because if the Germans attacked again, the men would simply shatter. Now, remember, the war had only been going on for a few weeks, and the First Army had fought two small battles in the grand scheme of things and was already completely in shambles. The army was in such bad shape that Renenkampf was under the idea that he had lost the last battle, which remember, he had won. The Germans had retreated. However, Renenkopf believed that they had simply pulled back because they couldn't take advantage of the situation they had created. He had no idea that he had caused them to retreat and had won a battle. However, Hindenburg wasn't aware of the realities of either army. Instead, he figured he would have to shift south to deal with the second army as it was still moving, as the first army had kind of paused. The reason why he thought that he needed to immediately confront the second army is because it was moving. It was supposed to be the, 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 the movement force of the incoming pincer attack that was hypothetically going to destroy the German Eighth Army. Whereas Hindenburg later wrote, quote, we had not merely to win a victory over Samsonov. We have to annihilate him. Only thus could we be free to deal with the second enemy, Renenkampf, who was plundering and burning through eastern Prussia, which is true. The German First Army was effectively a plague of locusts across anybody they came across. Uh, they were eating anything that was vaguely edible. Uh, they killed a lot of civilians. Um, the things that you would kind of expect from, a, from an invasion force in 1914, or 1939 for that matter. Um, slowly, the majority of the Eighth Army was peeled away from facing Renenkampf and set south. The only single cavalry division was left in place, armed with lances and handguns, to harass the entire Russian First Army. The idea, the idea was to ride around and cause havoc, 
and get them to believe that a much bigger force was opposing them. Um, how, how do you think this worked? Uh, I have an impression that it didn't go very well. Uh, and that basically at the first juncture, they realized this is probably just going to get everyone killed. Now, did they stop? That's a 50-50 <laughs> decision. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting because while it worked, um, and by worked, I meant the cavalry was able to act uh, like to ride as mounted cavalry. It did kind of keep the Russian first army on its toes. However, the eighth army had been marching constantly. Uh, and especially because, you know, they're changing orders at the last second. They, these men and horses have marched dozens of kilometers in only a couple of days. Uh, I think 50 or, or more. So they had rode their horses into the ground. Uh, so at this point, the vast majority of the German cavalry divisions were just infantry. They had no horses to speak of. Uh, so it was just some assholes with lances and handguns on foot. Um, in the south... The second army, the Russian second army, continued to march, but could not find anybody to fight. The Russians only had a few reconnaissance planes and couldn't find anybody with them. They launched entire attacks on what they thought was a German position, only to find an empty woods or swamps. When the Northwest Front commander, Zelensky, demanded that Samsonov keep searching for Germans, Samsonov had to explain that his army was too tired, despite still not having to fight a single battle. I mean... We love a shamming king, but at the same time, like this sounds like just an organization in freefall. Yeah, and what's interesting is again, this is August 1914, the month the war right. started, right? Like Right, exactly. Yeah, like like if you told me this is 1916 or 1917, you know, this was leading up to Russia exiting the war after like the Bolshevik Revolution. Okay, great, got it. But no, this is the literally the first few weeks yeah, of the they war. They stepped over the Russian border and immediately started falling, falling apart. <laughs> And crucially, this will never happen again in Russian no, history. I can't think of another example. Anyway, let's look out my window. Not once. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, finally, the Russians raided the town of Niedenburg, thinking the Germans were there. There actually wasn't. Then word got back to the commander. Uh, this is a powerful German name. All right. The local German army bicycle detachment commander, Lieutenant Bercher von Saher zum Wiesenstein. Uh, he heard uh, through a runner that, hey, there's Russians in Nidenburg, Nidenburg, whichever. So his boys all hopped on their fucking huffies, pedaled over to the town, and chased off an entire Cossack squadron. That's really amazing. I mean, I, I, <laughs> bicycle infantry is a thing that hasn't really survived. But like, there's a part of me deep down that's like, that would be sick. But then I'm like, the army makes everything suck. So no, it wouldn't be sick because you would just be like rocking on a bicycle. Yeah. And also back in those days, I imagine bike wheels were even if they had rubber tires were still like, it was harder than shit. Um, and you know, like the various mechanisms that make life easier on a bike now probably didn't exist, but this is kind of funny that like bicycle infantry won a battle against Cossacks who, you know, have something of an unwarranted legacy of being these fearsome cavalry, um, got chased off by a whole bunch of, you know, fancy boy, uh, uh, Germans on, uh, on pedal bikes. And then they, again, Peddled into town and ambushed a different group of Cossacks who had just got done pillaging nearby houses and were cooking their lunch in the middle of the town square. Then, after they chased off the Cossacks, they found a full copy of the Second Army's orders in plain Russian without any kind of coding whatsoever, which the Cossacks left behind after they ran. Once again, this will never happen again in Russian history. <laughs> the bicycle kings. I mean, I just find it very funny that it's just like in the middle of a complete just mishmash conflagration like a bunch of guys on bicycles are able to exploit the situation and do really well and it's just imagine being the cossacks like literally all of your military prestige comes like we are just unstoppable fucking doing pogroms left and right <laughs> just like fully fully just making life hell for every jewish person in the pale of settlement and then also like a bunch of germans on bikes whip our ass yeah i mean the cossacks can be fearsome warriors assuming they're storming the towns of unarmed jewish folks yeah, the exactly. The second you get confronted by some uh, some kraut boys on a bicycle, like, run away! Yeah, exactly. We can't yeah, exactly. possibly defeat this force. And again, it's a detachment. It's like less than 100 guys. And they chased off a fucking squadron. Embarrassing. The, Kos the Cossacks should still be ashamed of this. On top of literally everything else they've ever done while under arms for the Russians. 
I'm just just imagining a German like early machine gunner slash fucking just some kind of repeating rifle just doing a sick fucking spin on a mongoose <laughs> and just completely no scoping a bunch of Cossacks. Like, I know that's not how bicycles worked back then, but I am imagining there was at least one mongoose rider per squad in a bicycle platoon because someone had to be able to do sick jumps in order to call it like a like a faint operation in order to, you know, like like attract enemy fire so they could then fucking like pin it down, suppress them, etc. Like someone's got to be on there and there's got to be at least one guy as an ammo bearer or assistant gunner riding on his pegs. Oh, yeah. Like that's just how it this works. This is actually where how Dave Mira's great grandfather got his start, hitting a wheelie and just fucking <laughs> blowing the back walls out of a Cossack with a Mauser. <laughs> That normally, normally that turn of phrase is used to mean fucking them. So I mean, like in a way, either metaphorically works. fucked with a Mauser bullet. Yeah, exactly. But also maybe fucked for real because we we don't want to yeah, we don't want to assume there, there, anything there about be, their proclivities. There could be yet. star cl- star cross lovers across the front line. We don't know that. A lot of shit happened during the Christmas truce. Someone got their cheeks clapped. I mean, so <laughs> if you wrote a historical erotic fiction work about like a gay romance where someone found like a German bicycle infantry twink fighting against the Imperial Russian army. Like, you could probably... I mean, if people made a lot of money on a book called Taken by the T-Rex, which is about fucking a dinosaur, you could make money Wait, hold, off this. Hold I'm up, just hold saying. Hold up. Is this book real? Yes. Right. There was the thing I'll in, like, the early in, 2010s uh, where, like, people were basically selling erotic fiction on Amazon and, like, the more ridiculous it could be, the more sort of, like, meme-worthy joke content it could be, like, the better it was doing. Like... In the same way as I don't know if you're familiar with the author Quan Mills, but he does uh, stories like this. I, I I haven't read enough of his stuff to know if it's like fully meant to be erotic or just like kind of a joke. But Quan Mills does what you might call, and I'm not trying to take the piss here. He he writes what you might call like hood erotica. I mean, for example, <laughs> a book called "This Ho Got Roaches in Her Crib" and stuff like that. Um, Incredible. It's it's yeah. So. The Amazon self-published erotic fiction market is a real thing. And yes, there was a book called Taken by this the T-Rex. This book is only 5,000 words long. That's not even I a know, short exactly. story. exactly. And they make thousands of dollars because it's a joke. Like I said, it's meme worthy. Like my friend and I used to joke about doing like a sci-fi erotica series called Fuckscape Horizons. And if we had ever gotten our stuff together, we probably could have made money off this. And Maybe I'm just we'll saying, later. German <laughs> wo- World War One bicycle infantry twink star clock cross lover romance imperial russian army conscript who wants to desert there's got to be a guy oh whipping a, whipping ass on a mongoose even if it's a historical anachronism we'll make it work someone make that fan art uh okay i'm reading i i found this book on amazon it's called taken by the t-rex parentheses dinosaur erotica by christy sims and alara branwin this required two people to make it has two and a half stars drin is her tribe's chief huntress she lives for the thrill of the hunt. <laughs> Men and sex hold no allure for her, as Drin has never found a partner who could satisfy her. <laughs> what a T-Rex! <laughs> <laughs> when a T-Rex descends upon her village, destroying it, Drin demands that the tribe's hunters go in search for the beast and slaughter it. Opting for safety instead of revenge, the tribe moves to a new location, hoping that the big beast won't follow them. It does. Durin taunts the beast, giving its tribe mates time to flee. As she runs, leading it through a gauntlet of traps, the thrill of the hunt soars through her blood. Like I said. Leaving her wet with desire. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. When the angry T-Rex corners the huntress in a box canyon. It seems more interest. <laughs> it seems more interested in her wet womanhood than her flesh. Words five thousand eight hundred. This is like I said. Like there's maybe five people on this planet who ever jacked off to Clan of the Cave Bear, but like <laughs> someone decided to make a version of it that also involves dinosaurs, and it actually made money. Tom, leave all of that in. I don't care if this is Tannenberg <laughs> Part Two. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is why I could never be a voice actor because I couldn't hold it together for fucking thirty seconds. Oh, I know. I mean, I remember when we did the uh, the, the the radio play about the Kandahar giant. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we're all terrible at this job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, uh, in response to the Cossacks being chased off by some dudes on their mongooses, uh, the the Russians leveled the town with an artillery barrage because they couldn't handle the fact they'd been fucking routed by some dudes on bikes. Uh, however. This made Samsonov believe the Germans had actually retreated. Uh, 
uh, rather than pulling back uh, this one detachment. Because Samsonov didn't think this is a bicycle detachment. He thought this is like a major like uh, maneuver piece of the of the Eighth Army. And he, he yeah, the Germans have a bicycle group of armies for <laughs> yeah. some reason. That's just what they're doing. I do not understand why they are all on bicycles. It is because they are Jews. <laughs> Are there 300,000 bicycles in all of Europe? Why do Russian, why do Germans have these? I don't understand. They believe that they pulled back much further than the Masurian Lakes, which isn't really that important uh, right now. But the Masurian Lakes, which I'm sure I'm pronouncing incorrectly, uh, was supposed to be the pinch point for the pincer movement of the Russian first and second armies. So if they believed it to be true that the, the, that the Germans had retreated back further than the Masurian lakes, then in their mind, there was no point in trying to pin them against the lakes as they'd already retreated beyond them. So Samsonov scrapped his plans without consulting with Zelensky, which is the overall front commander, and shifted his army's march to the west, pulling him much, much further away the, uh, from Renenkov's first army. So now, despite the fact that these two armies are separate, there's no hope of them ever being able to support one another now. Furthermore, because, you know, splitting your forces, always a great idea. Um, exactly. You have the lions led by donkeys seal of yeah. approval on splitting your forces. And at this point, despite the fact we have a lot of stuff more to go through, I can say with full confidence, this is where Samsonov killed his entire command. Uh, he just had no idea yet. He has a couple more days to live. And I mean that Samsonov personally as well. He's not going to survive this either. Uh, uh, furthermore, the Russians had just picked up on German troop movements away from the first army moving towards the second. But rather than thinking they're moving to confront the second army, the Russians believe they must be retreating back, uh, back across the Vistula River and abandoning eastern Prussia. Zelensky, the overall commander, thought their plan should be to drive forward because they could not l allow them to uh, like uh, dig in behind the Vistula because the Vistula is a very easy place to defend. They, so Zelensky now believed that this offensive was now chasing down routing Germans, not fighting against two, or, or not fighting against an army that's still very much still functioning and going on the counteroffensive. They have no idea about any of this because their recon element does not exist. Their planes do not catch any of this, and uh, they're, they're not sending any scouts forward, really. The second army began their advance towards what they believed this fleeing group of Germans was so fast they left their flanks completely open and missed Hindenburg's buildup on the Russian left flank. Uh, there was German forces building up there, and the Russians literally just walked right by them. Once again, the lines led by Donkey Seal of Approval for leaving your flanks undefended. It works every time. It, not only undefended, but like not even considered. The Russians, driving forward without any scouting, ran into a German reserve corps, the 20 Corps, dug in around the town of Orlau. Instead of waiting within their positions for the Russians to come to them, the German forces launched themselves out of their trenches, waving flags, bands were playing, and soldiers were singing. This terrified the Russians, who turned around and ran because they had no idea there was even Germans there in the first place, and they suddenly appeared singing at them. They ran back to their own positions, and the, and the Germans gave chase. Sword fights erupted, soldiers began bayoneting one another, and more than one person was literally bitten to death via another person's teeth. The Russians tripped over their feet into a different battle at the town of Lana and began running into Germans they did not know were dug in there all over the place, again, because they decided not to scout ahead. And despite being massively outnumbered, again, this is a single German reserve corps, full, like, mm -hmm. backup guys, just blunted an entire army in advance. After two days of fighting, Hindenburg and Lundorf met with the 20th Corps commander, Frederick Schultz, who told them how badly fucked his unit was if the Russians actually got their shit together and deployed their entire army at once. Because Samsonov really had no span of command. He couldn't organize this into an actual full advance. He was sending, P like an action movie, he was sending one unit at a time to assault these places because that's the only amount of troops he could effectively command at once. Um, However, this was the whole plan for the 20th Corps to hold in place and not to break. Schultz just didn't know it yet because Hindenburg and Lundorf didn't tell him. You know, fewer people know about the plan that you're coming up with, the, fewer, the, the less mm -hmm. ways it can leak out. 20 Corps was to hold in place while Mekinson and Von Francois moved into the positions they would need in order to attack the flank of the entire Second Russian, uh, Second Russian Army. If they allowed Schultz to retreat like he wanted, and 
admittedly did make sense if you're Schultz in this position, the entire plan would go to hell and the Russians would be able to be uh, march by un, uh, unopposed. Schultz is ordered to hold his position to the last man. And again, he had no idea, but he was probably fighting the most important part of the upcoming Battle of Tannenberg because without him holding, it wouldn't be able to unfold the way it did. Schultz is worried that a full frontal assault on his position by the entirety of Russian forces in his sector must be coming. And if that happened, his corps would be destroyed. And to his credit, he was 100% right. He stood no chance if the full weight of the Russian Second Army fell on him. But weirdly, it didn't. And it seems the best way we can think of this is that the Russians simply couldn't bring their entire army on target at once. And they simply stopped attacking his positions after they were forced back the first time. They simply changed the route of their advance, leaving their left flank even more open and more spread out, giving more space to the Germans. While Schultz was holding, Francois and Mekinson's men were rapidly being moved into position on the left flank. They're actually already supposed to be in place on account of the strict German army timetables that we talked about during our last episode. However, timetables don't account for things that are not men walking. There had been a flash storm that had flooded several rail lines, which had slowed down their deployment. Not only their deployment, but all of the material they would need for a counter assault. Now, the, the troops slowly were moved into place on the count of the, the rail lines not working. From, and this date was moved back from August 25th to August 26th, which meant that Schultz would have to hold in position longer and longer. Hindenburg was beginning to panic that the 1st Army would turn and head south in order to support Samsonov, as they had finally begun to move. However, as if on cue, the Russian Northwest Front commander sent the 1st Army orders via radio in plain Russian that told him to halt hundreds of miles away no sooner than August 26th. Meaning, there was absolutely no chance that Samsonov would get help once the Germans launched their plan. There was no way Renenkov's men could cover that distance on foot in such a short amount of time. And if that wasn't bad enough, the Russians then radioed the positions, the exact positions of the second army the next day. Normally, this, you, you, can, you might be able to believe this is like a ruse of some kind, like this is disinformation. Sure. But remember, they had captured those plans from the Cossacks in Nidenberg. So they could literally check the work. And like, so Hindenburg could check the, 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 the written orders that the Cossacks dropped and compare them to the radio orders and be like, oh no, these are still the same. Because despite knowing possibly that his orders had fallen into enemy hands, Samsonov had not changed his plans whatsoever. Francois was still not entirely in place on the 25th. And as only about half of his men and guns had arrived, even his ammunition supply hadn't arrived yet because of the late trains. Still, Hindenburg ordered him to go on the attack on the town of Usadu. Francois shrugged, knowing he kind of didn't have the ability to go on the attack, and said, quote, Naturally, the attack will be made. Of course, the men must f- fight with bayonets, because he had not received ammunition yet. With intercepted radio transmission in hand, Hindenburg told his staff on the night of the 25th, quote, Gentlemen, our preparations are so well in hand that we can sleep soundly tonight. Well, that's always a good sign. I'm sure that's not going to portend anything. Uh, well, it portends a whole lot of, uh, of surrendering Russians very, very, very soon. I mean, well, the German army doesn't exactly work flawlessly either, but Samsonov had finally noticed a large buildup of Germans on his left flank by this point. He thought about stopping his advance to face them, which would have been the correct idea, but there is no real way in order for him to do so. All of his corps were widely spaced apart, and even the units within those corps had largely lost contact with one another. His army had devolved into mostly just a collection of dudes going on a shitty walk through Prussia. The amount of men making that walk is dropping drastically as the hard marching and empty stomachs with no water, you know, on top of being fresh conscripts with no history of campaigning, people are dropping like flies. He knew he couldn't really concentrate his forces, so he didn't. He kept his main body advancing, sending reinforcements to the left as he went. However, even this did not work. One unit he sent was so far away that they had no chance to reach the left flank on time. The two cavalry divisions he ordered to respond couldn't even be located. One division that might make it there was full of fresh conscripts, led by, and this is in Samsonov's opinion, the worst commander in his army, a guy named Lieutenant General Artinomov. Uh, Francois, meanwhile, had gotten new orders. At 4 a.m., he was to attack the Sieben Heights, which would require him to advance over open ground, cross a small river, and attack uphill. 
and his train still had not yet arrived with cannon uh, ammunition. In case he thought about refusing orders yet again, which he had done previously again, Hindenburg warned him that his unit would attack with or without him in command of it. However, Francois found a way around this. He continued to be a little shit and reported his bosses that the attack was in progress at 5.30, when in reality, he hadn't even ordered his unit to march yet. He then called multiple times after he had told them the attack had begun, asking him to delay the attack, and by noon, he actually had still not ordered his forces to attack, despite the fact they would be fighting for over five hours at that point. He got an angry phone call demanding to know why the position hadn't been taken, and he lied, saying his soldiers had been fighting for hours, but he still didn't have his ammunition trained for his artillery, so it was impossible for infantry to take such an object unsupported, which, to be fair, he was probably right. Francois, in my opinion, is not in the wrong here. He seems to be one of the few commanders in World War I is like, that's just going to get my soldiers killed. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Uh, so crit, like that's why I said in the last episode that I fucking love this guy. Um, the, the rare, the rare sort of sensible approach here. Yeah, and the only reason that he was kind of uh, invulnerable of being fired is that Ludendorff knew he was a talented commander, and he also didn't know who could replace him, so he simply didn't fire him for insubordination. Finally, Francois gave orders to attack at 1 p.m. Despite the fact already telling his commander that it started at 5:30 a.m. Uh, and he also then told the commander, uh, told Ludendorff, I'm giving my men an hour before we attack because he wanted them to eat lunch first. I mean, look, fuck it. You know what? Yeah, this guy rocks. He's legitimately the best person in the series. Do a little MRE heater action, you know, make your make a little sloppy Joe yeah. thing, you know, even heat up, break up the Cheez-Its and heat them up Hell too, yeah. you know, take your time. There's a reason why his soldiers loved him and all of his superior commanders fucking hated him. It's extremely yeah. funny. <laughs> I'm genuinely. Uh, the Sieben Heights fell quite rapidly, but it took another two hours to reform his uh, corps together and try to move on Usadu, the, the town that he was also supposed to attack. But by now, his men were out of water and heat exhaustion was taking over as is the middle of the day. And he called the attack off uh, and, and did so without clearance once again. But this time, Ludendorff was like, okay, fine, I get it. At the German center, Recon pointed out that there's a large gap between the Russian center and the Russian right flank, which is where Francois was attacking. Schultz's men were ordered to move forward and test to see what would happen. The entire Russian left, held by the 2nd Division, was enveloped and pushed south towards a lake. Pretty much without resisting. They're like, oh look, Germans, let's run that way. Now, this was hardly easy for the German soldiers, however. The unit had never seen combat before and was filled with what was known as, uh, Showalter puts it as, quote, the enthusiasm of the inexperienced, having no idea how bad combat was going to be. They rushed forward without taking cover, and they ran so fast into fire, they crossed the sights of their own artillery. But they couldn't make contact with their artillery because they didn't have any radios of any kind, so they just had to run faster to try to outrun their artillery and close in on the Russians, which seems like an all-around bad idea, but it worked. This was made worse by the terrain. It was hilly and broken, so German gun commanders weren't entirely sure how to support their troops with artillery, so they just pushed their artillery forward, bringing it online with their, artil- with their infantry and dragging it along with their advance. This is fucking stupid, but it did help them to stop blowing up their own men. The Russians attempted a counterattack, but ran into a German machine gun company, which is made up of only six Maxim machine guns. This ended in the deaths of hundreds of Russians. The Russian commander of this unit was desperately trying to take the machine guns, attempting to uh, apparently use the, the, the kill bot tactic from Futurama and just kept feeding Russian infantry into these six machine guns, figuring they'd have to reload eventually. But Yeah, maybe the barrel will get hot at some point. You yeah, know. and the Germans defeat this by simply having two guns not fire while the other ones fire and then cover them when they're reloading and vice versa. So, yeah. The Russian commander screamed threats that he would murder anybody who didn't obey him, being fed directly into the buzzsaw. Uh, And uh, by the time Schultz's attack finally stopped, the Russian 2nd Division was rendered completely combat ineffective and destroyed within a few hours of fighting. Uh, Their division suffered 3,000 casualties, the vast majority of them from artillery and machine gun fire. So, well well done. Um, Now, at this point, the entire Russian right flank was teetering on the brink of collapse. On Schultz's left, this was supposed to be to, the, uh, to be the left of General Kurt von Morgan, commander of the 3rd Reserve Division. But Morgan just didn't march when he was ordered to, and then didn't 
inform the 8th Army Command that he was not marching. So all the way until 6 p.m. that night, everyone thought the Russian right flank was being taken by von Morgan. Nobody's entirely sure why Morgan did this, though Morgan insists that because, like we talked about in the last episode, the, the, this part of Prussia has some pretty thick forests, and Morgan would have had to march through a forest, and he insisted he could be walking directly into a trap, though there was no intelligence to give this idea. He simply cooked, cooked it up in his own mind. Nobody's sure why he thought that. Elsewhere, the German forces continued their steady gains, even if now they are pushing their men to the point that they are dropping from ragged feet and heat stroke. In one case, 50% of a German division dropped out from a 50-kilometer forced march without a break or water supply. So, yeah, just eating their own men alive. That's like 30 miles in August. That yeah. sucks. Yeah, it's just there's no way to describe that as anything but With, Without break, without water, nothing. Yeah, yeah. The Ost Group, which is the name given to two corps that were made into one group under the command of Mekinson, struck out at Bischofsburg, a linchpin of the Russian flank, which would be needed to be secured for the greater plan to be used. Samsonov finally, maybe, realized he had seriously fucked up by leaving his left so wide open and ordered an entire corps to protect the town. And again, for reasons nobody is entirely sure of, the order simply never got to the unit, so nothing happened. Though Mekinson's men were half dead at this point, they'd been marching nonstop for hours and just simply couldn't go on anymore when the order was given at 8 a.m. on the 27th. They had no idea that their Ost group had just stopped directly in front of two Russian divisions who had dug in around Bischofsburg and another town, Ortelsburg. So after Russian snipers began picking people off, the dead, tired soldiers were forced to dig themselves in while getting shot at. Meanwhile, Mekinson called for reinforcements, and the 35th Division was ordered on a force march to go help them out. However, the 35th was not long for this world. They'd been disintegrating for hours under the stress of constant force marching. They had been throwing away their backpacks and rifles because they were so exhausted. And that's despite the fact that like, not carrying a rifle in the German army at the time was punishable by lashing. They would rather be like, fuck it, lash me, I'm not carrying this anymore. Some companies had thrown away so much gear that 100 men only had 60 rifles between them. So after a few hours of walking, they were called off as reinforcements when their commander was like, I can't fucking control these guys. They're done. They, won't, they will not fight. Like, you can't send them into battle. So they didn't. Somehow during all of this, the Russians were still convinced that the Germans were retreating towards the Vistula, and they were not. In fact, caught in the middle of a large counteroffensive and had really no way out. So despite the Russians having Mekinson pinned in, they began to pull soldiers away and send them west, hoping to chase down these mythical fleeing German forces. This led to the two armies accidentally smacking right into one another. A German brigade made up of older men, so old in fact they had not been trained on the concept of indirect fire from artillery or the operation of machine guns, and a Russian division. The battle played out so strangely it could be from some kind of surrealist war film. While getting hammered with machine guns and artillery, the older German reservists, who had probably done training back with, with the Prussian military, stuck to their training, which at the time was keeping to a light pace while marching towards the enemy so as not to tire themselves out and stick together. So they effectively calmly walked up to the Russian machine gun and artillery positions and destroyed them. Just a stroll through a, 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 a graveyard, effectively. Then, German officers drew their swords, sounded a full charge using bugles, and then charged on horseback. Again, this is World War I. At this point, the Russian 16th Division Commander, General Blyayovsky, uh, Blagyovsky, fuck, I don't know, I give up, <laughs> uh, realized that, wow, I'm probably not fighting or retreating our enemy anymore. He immediately ordered his forces to turn around, marched straight down the one road they had been walking down, and moved towards Bischofsburg. However, he made them move so fast, the division got bunched up into something like a human traffic jam. They forgot to secure their uh, rear guard and flanks, and then German artillerymen on nearby hilltops sighted in their guns on the road. Within a few hours of shelling, the entire division was destroyed. Other Russian commanders, who also thought they were fighting a retreating enemy, just kept sending men towards Bischofsburg without any kind of scouting or communications with one another down this one road. It was effectively a firing squad of, our, of German artillery directly down on a Congo line of very confused Russian conscripts. 
After each one of these advances was smashed by the Germans, the Russian Sixth Corps, the entire corps of that, that all of these units are a part of, collapsed and retreated alone without orders while the Germans weren't even chasing them. They retreated so quickly that Samsonov had no idea that they had broken. Hundreds, if not thousands, of these fleeing Russian soldiers ran directly into the swamps of Missouri, getting trapped in the muck, and some of them drowned in the middle of the night with no one coming to save them. The general in charge of this was so embarrassed, he did not report to uh, General Samsonov until the next day. So, again, a 24-hour period where the army commander has no idea one of his entire corps has been wiped out. Back with Francois, the attack on Osadu would begin with the artillery barrage at 4 a.m. Yeah, they finally got their ammo. It only took a whole other day. For the men of the attack, this is the first time they had a full night's sleep and a hot meal in about a week, which obviously makes running into the meat grinder of World War I much easier, though intel did not get any better for the Germans. At 5 a.m., Francois got a report that his men had captured the town, which was weird because according to his timetable, they weren't even supposed to be there yet. So he sent some men from his army command to go check out the report to see if it was true only for them to get shot at when their car got near the town. It turned out some very young, excited officer captured a farmhouse and reported that he had captured the entire town on his own. Great job. The one thing that helped the Germans in this situation was the terrible Russian commander, Artamov, who wasn't commanding at all. He left everything to his junior commanders, meaning nobody was coordinating the overall defense, while he simply walked around and made small talk with regular soldiers. Then... Finally discovering he was about to be attacked, decided the best defense is a great offense and ordered his brigade to assault a nearby German unit, the only one where he knew their actual location. However, this just opened a larger gap between the Russian First Corps and Samsonov's entire formation center, which is where Schultz is able to assault and send a Russian division running. The brigade he ordered into combat ran right into the attacking Germans who not only had the Russians to contend with, but their own artillery once again, because the Germans kept shelling themselves throughout this entire battle. Finally, a lone bugler climbed a nearby hill and played uh, a tune to tell the artillery to stop fucking blowing them up. And uh, yeah, and then, you know, Cossacks appeared and chased off the rest of the German brigade. But by 11 a.m., Usado was in German hands, and another German brigade was attacking towards a, a nearby town called Gross Towersee. However, the colonel who gave the orders gave them in the dumbest possible way. He simply ordered his men to, quote, advance towards the rising sun. However, it was foggy that morning, and no one could pinpoint where exactly that was. So men just kind of meandered into the distance into a direction that had not been reconned in any way and ran directly into dugged Russians, as they kept doing. The brigade fell apart in the chaos as more and more men were thrown in to try to stabilize the situation. Artillery got stuck in the mud. Uh, ammo wagons got lost. Officers couldn't find out where the hell their men had gone. And by the time it was all over, half of a German division was put out, uh, out of commission. Despite this victory, the Germans retreated once again without orders from Samsonov or Samsonov knowing where the fuck they were. Not even the entire First Corps retreated together. It was piecemeal, and whoever got the message kind of thing, by the time the sun went down, random bits and pieces of Russians were still in place, having never received any orders to retreat at all. Uh, and it stretched north to the town of Saldau. And uh, there was no... All these little pockets of Russian defenders in this area had no communications with one another, no coronation of any kind. At this point, effectively no commander of the own defense of the area. The elements that did retreat didn't even retreat back towards the rest of the second army and simply just sprinted off into the distance on their own. They actually retreated so fast that when the Germans advanced later that night, they thought it was some kind of unnerving trap that, uh, that they needed to be worried about, that there's some like tens of thousands of enemy soldiers hiding because why would they be retreating so fast other than to lure them in, when in reality it was just a rout. Uh, the next morning when the attack was ordered once again, they ran to the tattered remnants of the Russian 2nd Division who had barely escaped their lives the day before. A Russian staff officer who immediately ordered his men to surrender said his soldiers hadn't eaten in three days and most people only had one or two bullets between them. They retreated as soon as they saw Germans. And this happened a lot. Like For, for some Russian units, the second they saw the German army, they threw down their weapons and surrendered without firing a shot. Then came the Russian attack towards Allenstein. Uh, 
Uh, General Kuliev had heard that several other Russian uh, corps were marching towards the town of Allenstein to put pressure on the German left flank. However, while he had gotten orders to carry out the attack, he couldn't get in contact with any other units that were supposed to be heading that way. That's because in one case, the 6th Corps, which we already talked about, simply didn't exist anymore. And this is one of the units that he was told was supposed to support him. And in others, there wasn't enough wire cable laid for the different command sites to talk to one another. And as if that wasn't bad enough, the Russians had wheeled a giant radio transmitter nearby, which was so powerful it jammed local communications. So, unable to get in contact with anyone, Kluyev just marched his men towards the sound of combat. Allenstein fell, but only because the Germans were not actually defending it. The Russian forces came into town doing what they normally do, uh, acting like a horde of locusts as they've been out of food and water for days. This all happened without the Germans' knowledge because a few hours later, a German train pulled into Allenstein Station and on board was a single German lieutenant, part of the 8th Army's general staff, who had been sent there to make arrangement and find housing for the German unit that was supposed to be arriving shortly. He pulled right up towards a group of Russian soldiers eating lunch by the train station and got in a kind of Mexican standoff stare-down situation before they realized, like, oh, oh, fuck, the Russians are here and started shooting at each other as the train slowly pulled away. Elsewhere, the Russians had abandoned Bischofsburg, with German scout planes reporting an entire corps of Russian soldiers were retreating south. The order was given to Mekinson to chase them down, leading with their cavalry and everybody else catching up. Somewhat hilariously, kind of what we already talked about, the German cavalry broke down first because the horses were pretty much already dead on their feet, uh, and soon infantry who had stolen bicycles from passing evacuating civilians were pedaling their way towards the Russian army. Because everybody knows at this point, the, the Russians' kryptonite is Germans on bicycles. Fair enough. The, the Russians had been fleeing so quickly that the town of Passenheim was, uh, was completely abandoned. But behind, they left their entire ammunition stockpile and a chest containing their, like, their, their pay chest for paying their soldiers. So whoops! not only do you not get ammo now, you don't get your paycheck. Then word finally got back to the German command about the situation in Allenstein, so Mekinson was ordered to call off the chase, turn, and attack south towards the town in the hope that the Russians would be driven south directly into the positions held by the other German army units. However, Mekinson only found this out hours after the fact because he still didn't actually have a phone link with the 8th Army Command and his subordinate, Fritz von Bello, simply didn't tell him and pass the order. Now... This one we actually have a reason for because Bello uh, uh, or Bello uh, later said, like, I only got a partial order that made no sense. So I decided not to tell my boss until I got a full picture, which does make sense. Eventually, someone had to get in a car and drive over to his command center and tell him, hey, you're supposed to be going on the offensive right now. While all of this was happening, Samsonov literally had no idea what was going on within his own ranks. Only hours after it happened, he was learning about the growing list of destroyed units or that thousands of his men were wrong, running in the wrong direction and tens of thousands of others had already surrendered. He gave out orders to some generals to try to stem the flow, plug the gaps in the line, but several of them simply refused to take part in this, saying that like this plan is stupid, it's not going to work. His, com- his command influence is failing at this point. One man, Nikolai Martos, insisted that he had the Germans on the ropes. Martos still believed that the Germans were retreating. And moving his men from this position was stupid. Therefore, if you want to move my men, you need to fire me and replace me if, if you want to move my forces. As Martos is one of several uh, Russian generals who came at Samsonov that way. Like, if you, if you want to take control of my men away from me by giving me orders, which is your job, you have to fire me. So. He simply couldn't control his own men. Instead of sending more forces towards Allenstein to defend it, Martos would launch his own offensive, because sure, why not? This would include three corps of Russian soldiers and be an attempt to center the Russian main body against the Germans in the south on August 28th, 1914. This decision, made largely because Samsonov had lost control of his command, would set the stage for the total and complete disaster of the Russian Imperial forces, over the next two days. And that is where we'll pick up on part three, the conclusion of the Battle of Tannenberg. Yeah, so far, this is just more of a surprise of just the degree to which all command is breaking down and the, the just incredible, terrible conditions that people are putting up with. So yeah, I'm, I'm in a way, I was just sort of listening in silence and I was like, wow, this sucks. Wow, that sucks. Wow, that sucks. That really fucking sucks. It's just like, 
No, nah, just disaster. Just like complete mishmash. And it's like, you're, if you were historically going to be there, you would be one of the dudes whose job it was to get eaten up by a machine gun. Oh, yeah. Like, it's uh, absolutely. And like, again, they're, from the second they crossed the border, these armies were falling apart. And the, like, from the description that I'm giving, the German army was also falling apart under the stress of yeah. early combat with fresh soldiers. And we're kind of seeing like the small differences between the two of them that made it so one goes down in history as like, or these two generals, uh, Ludendorff and, and Hindenburg, go down as geniuses simply because they their military did not fall apart as fast as the Russians did. As fast. In part yeah. three, we're going to see that the Germans are also completely disintegrating under the, th- under the stress of campaigning in the open in August of 1914. Uh, but we'll see more on that on part three. Nate, you can use this area to plug your shows for the few people who don't already know what they are. Yeah, so um, I am the co-host of What a Hell of a Way to Die, which is a show I host with Francis Horton about why you shouldn't join the military um, and many other things. I'm also the producer of this show. I am the co-host and producer of Trash Future, a podcast about business success and the horror of the tech industry being very, very stupid. And I produce Kill James Bond, a movie podcast by the three funniest trans people on the planet, Abigail Thorne, Alice Caldwell Kelly, and Devin. You should check out all those shows. If you haven't already, check out all those shows. And if you like what we do here on Lines Little by Donkeys, consider supporting us on Patreon. You get episodes like this early. You get bonus episodes. You get Discord access and a very cool community. Um, you get all sorts of stuff uh, depending on how much you, you want to support. And if you don't want to support us, that's fine. It's your money. Do with it what you will. But leave us a review on wherever you listen to podcasts. It helps us a lot. And uh, hopefully, we continue making content worth your time and hopefully your money. Uh, Nate, again, thank you for joining me on this. Much longer than anticipated episode as we tend to do when we're together. And uh, I look forward into concluding this series in part three, where hundreds of thousands of people are about to die. Whoops. Yep. It wouldn't be a Lions episode if that wasn't going to be on the horizon. But once again, Joe, very, very wonderful experience talking, listening, learning, and discovering that this is definitely one of those eras of life where you don't want to be in the YouTube comments being like, I was born in the wrong year (laughs) because it fucking sucks. And it is now canon on this podcast. The Battle of Tannenberg includes T-Rex erotica. And we'll talk to everybody next week. Later.